of uh, my, migration and the human um, is actually a very, very, I think, healthy for us starting point. So we have four, uh, four interventions in this panel of the morning. Uh, the first is going to be by Oscar Martinez, who is a journalist, uh, former director of uh, El Faro, um, and he coordinated the En El Camino project on the Central American migration throughout Mexico. His book, Los Inmigrantes eh, No Importan, was translated as The Beast, and it won uh, a number of prizes, um, and he's won a number of prizes, eh, including both in Mexico, the Journalism Prize in Mexico in 2009, eh, and the Human Rights uh, Prize eh, at the University of Salvador. He's also gotten recognition here at Columbia, um, although we ju only just met, actually, but, uh, but Oscar has been uh, 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 so very much uh, connected to the School of Journalism here. So I'm delighted to welcome him uh, back. And I'll go ahead and introduce uh, all three, three of the speakers. The fourth is myself, who I already, I already introduced myself. Uh, the second speaker is going to be Mark Edelman, your colleague from uh, CUNY, from the uh, Hunter College. Um, he's a professor in the Department of Anthropology and uh, um, a longtime uh, expert, highly published expert on agrarian issues and land issues in uh, Central America. His, a, a book on land use, land tenure, uh, his books, his works on land use, land tenure patterns are actually a critical reading for anyone not only uh, who's interested in the agrarian history of Central America, but actually who's interested in questions of agrar uh, sort of rural uh, and agrarian strife in the 20th century and into the 20th, 21st uh, century. And he's not an expert on migration, actually, uh, but rather one of the people who knows a lot about Central America who's here in the city. We have three main contingents of speakers uh, in this conference. One uh, a group of colleagues from Central America, one group of colleagues from Mexico, and the third that is a kind of New York-based, homegrown group, and Mark is part of that third group, as am I, and as is our third speaker, Nara Milanić, my dear colleague from uh, Barnard College, who is a historian of Latin America, her book, and of family, family history, um, as well as the sort of state legibility and, f and uh, family history. She has a book, uh, uh, quite a remarkable work, on a, um, a family in 19th century Chile, um, and has been working uh, of late on in um, uh, detention centers uh, in Texas, I believe. Um, so she's going to be sharing her work from there. And finally, I'm going to share a few comments as well. So, bienvenido, Oscar, for us. Well, thank you. Uh, the only thing that I'm going to say in English is that I'm going to speak in, in Spanish. So, <laughs> no, no, sorry, but my vocabulary in English is too short, so I prefer to use my right to speak in Spanish. Bueno, gracias. <clears throat> Perdón por mi voz. Eh, estoy... Llevo unos días resfriado, muy resfriado, y si no escuchan, por favor, díganlo. Voy a intentar hablar lento. Eh, puedo repetir lo que guste. Es un honor estar aquí, gracias por la invitación. A nosotros siempre de alguna forma no ha dejado de conmovernos que, que, que nos volteen a ver en estos grandes centros de pensamiento, porque durante mucho tiempo no nos volteaban a ver mucho. Eh, pues yo vengo del más pequeño de esos países mexicanos, de El Salvador. Eh, Yo soy periodista, entonces he trabajado en El Faro, que es un medio digital que se creó en 1998, el primer medio digital de América Latina. Y cuento rápidamente, porque esto no es una charla acerca de lo que he hecho, sino de lo que hemos logrado entender. Cómo creo que empezamos nosotros al revés a la hora de entender la, lo, el, el proceso de la gente que huía. La primera investigación que yo dirigí como jefe, como jefe de investigaciones especiales del periódico fue entre el año 2007 y 2010 en México, cuando recorrimos la ruta con los migrantes centroamericanos para intentar explicar a qué se exponían. Siempre cuento, no me detendré mucho en eso en esta ocasión, 
que nosotros pensábamos que aquello iba a ser una cobertura que tenía que ver con las condiciones habituales que los migrantes enfrentan cuando cruzan México, como lo dijo el, el investigador Rodolfo Casillas de Flaxo, en un promedio de un mes, abordando cerca de ocho trenes, etc. Que era el frío, el hambre, las vicisitudes de cruzar un país como México. Pero aquella decisión, aquella división que se completó en el año 2007 entre el cártel del Golfo y los Zetas, terminó de hacer que nosotros nos viéramos o nos enfrentáramos a una cobertura que tenía más que ver con crimen organizado y condiciones masivas de delitos contra los migrantes, secuestros masivos, rutas creadas de trata entre el sur y el norte, principalmente con una ciudad de destino que era Reynosa. Eh, cuotas en la frontera, en cada uno de los pequeños puntos de la frontera con Estados Unidos, puntos de los que se habla muy poco, hablamos de las grandes ciudades de la frontera, pero poca gente habla de los pequeños puntos, de elegidos Acumé, de elegido La Nariz, de Sonoita, de Algodones, de Caborca, de Altar, del Sásabe, de los pequeños puntos donde las cosas realmente ocurren. Pasamos tres años viajando en esa ruta migratoria para intentar entender qué es lo que ocurría con los migrantes que intentaban cruzar México sin permiso de nadie, para entrar aquí sin permiso de nadie. Y al final nos dimos cuenta de que aquella trágica situación, pongo si quieren número, recuerdo el informe tardío que sacó la Comisión Nacional de Derechos Humanos Mexicana, que en el año 2009, muy tarde, años tarde, se enteró de que había secuestro en México y eh, estimó en 25 millones de dólares las ganancias de los grupos criminales que perpetraban esos secuestros en una encuesta que solo había sido elaborada durante seis meses y con poco personal. Pero recuerdo que luego el reto de nosotros, algo que nos avergonzó como periodistas centroamericanos, como periodistas del Faro, que pretendíamos explicar mecanismos más complejos, fue darnos cuenta de que no podíamos explicar por qué esa gente estaba dispuesta a cruzar ese terrible camino, huyendo de qué. Es decir, sabíamos números y sabíamos sensaciones de violencia en Centroamérica, sabíamos y fuimos criados durante una guerra, y conocíamos la brutal posguerra que enfrentamos en los años 90. Pero no podíamos explicar a ciencia cierta para el año 2010 qué eran las pandillas, cómo se habían creado, qué influencia tenían en el control de territorios donde habita el 60% de la población salvadoreña, zonas conurbadas, cantones, caseríos, zonas rurales. No podíamos explicar por qué esos cerca de 250 mil personas que cada año cruzaban México o que eran al menos detenidas en México por el Instituto Nacional de Migración, estaban dispuestas a enfrentarse a ese infierno para llegar a algo, a esa entelequia que se llama el sueño americano, que ya no, 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 se, la, no se la cree ni quien pronuncia esas palabras actualmente. Se sabe que aquí hay, 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 lo que hay para los migrantes aquí es mucho sueño, americanos si quieren, pero mucho sueño. No, entonces volvimos al volví al Salvador, digo volvimos porque lo hicimos con un equipo de fotógrafos, documentalistas y en el año 2011 empezamos el proyecto Sala Negra de cobertura de violencia llevamos ocho años intentando explicar en el Triángulo Norte qué nos pasa, es decir, cómo somos esos modelos para no armar cómo gradualmente construimos sociedades que expulsan a decenas de miles de personas cada año entonces, bueno, la, 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 la charla que me toca o mi participación se tituló huir, el verbo de miles. Yo no era consciente cuando la primera palabra eh, de mi primer libro, de los migrantes que no importan o de bis, era es huyo, es la declaración de un migrante salvadoreño que se llama Auner. Y su primera declaración es huyo. Me encantaría decirles que fue voluntario, pero haciendo buena memoria creo que no lo fue. Creo que simplemente... Eh, es algo que ocurrió en las entrevistas. Y esto es muy importante. El verbo migrar en Centroamérica después de la guerra civil, de los acuerdos de paz del, del 92, está íntimamente relacionado con cuestiones económicas, con progresar, con construir una vida diferente. Toda la retórica que en El Salvador se arma alrededor de los migrantes, los monumentos que se llaman hermano migrante, bienvenido a casa, los performances con los que vamos a traer a un migrante al aeropuerto cuando regresa, es decir, si ves un camión lleno de salvadoreños en el aeropuerto van a traer a un migrante, pero cada persona del camión espera una cosa, es decir, la, 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 la cosificación del migrante exitoso convertido en un equipo de sonido, en una camisa de Los Ángeles Lakers y del migrante fracasado convertido en un deportado que es casi sinónimo de un delincuente. 
Entonces nosotros empezamos a intentar entender sobre todo el fenómeno de las pandillas, porque teníamos claridad y hay algunos datos con que espero demostrarlo, que era lo que estaba generando la mayor cantidad de huidas, al menos de mi país. Digo algo, porque el tiempo tampoco es tan largo, me burlaba un poco ahora de nosotros mismos cuando nos molestamos mucho, cuando dicen que somos países mexicanos, no, 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 no estoy llamando aquí a que nos llamen países mexicanos cada vez que quieran, pero nosotros mismos nos definimos como Triángulo Norte y eso, esa construcción casi que ha definido una especie de país cuando hay diferencias severas en, en múlti por múltiples razones entre Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras y mucho más entre sus ecosistemas criminales o sus índices de homicidios que en Guatemala, por ejemplo, tienden a ser muy distintos a los que tenemos ahora mismo en El Salvador o en Guatemala, ya desde hace algunos años. No digo que Guatemala no sea un país violento con esto. Entonces, hablaré del caso concreto de El Salvador, para no hacer esa extraña extrapolación a tres países que parecen contarse como si fuese con nosotros. El, según el NUR, esto, tirando datos generales, nosotros somos un país de refugio. Desde el año 79, más de 3 millones de salvadoreños han solicitado refugio en diferentes países, principalmente México, Estados Unidos, Australia, Italia principalmente entre el 79 y el 90, es decir, el periodo donde la guerra fue más intenso, la preguerra que le llaman en el 79, el asesinato de Monseñor Romero en el 80, la masacre del Mozote en el año 81 y la, la, la locura como, o, o el abismo, como le llamamos en El Salvador, hasta cerca del año 90, cuando las dos fuerzas militares se enteran de que por esa vía nadie iba a ganar el conflicto armado y empiezan desde el 89 los intentos serios, por así decir, de firmar una paz. Tras los 90, la palabra migración se estableció como un proceso netamente económico relacionado con todo ese tejido social de gente que había huido de Centroamérica y que se había instalado principalmente en el sur de California. Es decir, por razones obvias, los migrantes que fueron no huyendo, sino buscando prosperidad, se acercaron a aquel lugar donde había una red salvadoreña muy armada. Si ustedes, y supongo que lo han hecho, han ido al área de Pico Union en Los Ángeles, saben que no necesitan conocer ni una palabra en inglés para poder moverse tranquilamente y hablar con quien ustedes quieran. Pero tras los 90, empezó uno de los fenómenos que más marcaron la huida de la región, me refiero a las pandillas. Aquí hay un matiz que tiene que ver con asumir responsabilidades. Supongo que en un salón como este no tengo por qué elaborar sobre toda la ayuda militar que Estados Unidos proporcionó a los, al ejército salvadoreño, a los ejércitos centroamericanos, pero al salvadoreño, hablo del caso concreto, durante los 12 años de guerra. Es un ejército que empezó demostrando su vocación asesina, es decir, la guerra en El Salvador, muchos historiadores la marcan en el sepelio de Monseñor Romero en el centro de San Salvador, después de un asesinato perpetrado con militares, el francotirador era militar, el, el capitán Álvaro Sarabia es quien consiguió el, el arma de precisión que lo asesinó y el mayor Roberto Dawison fue quien operativizó la orden de asesinar a Monseñor Romero. En el año 81 se da una de las masacres más numerosas conocidas en América Latina, cerca de mil personas mueren en la región del Mozote, al norte de El Salvador, una masacre perpetrada por el batallón Atlacat, entrenado y creado con fondo estadounidense. Es decir, la huida de los años 80 y de, de principios de los años 90 tiene una relación directa con a quien decidió Estados Unidos apoyar, decide apoyar a un ejército que perpetraba crímenes de guerra. Hay una relación directa con la erogación de fondos hacia ese país. Es decir, asumir la migración o la huida de centroamericanos como algo neta, como un problema netamente de países empobrecidos, donde la gente nace con un ADN violento, no solo es hipócrita, sino que es cínico para un país como Estados Unidos. Es decir, es renunciar no a una construcción histórica, es que la palabra histórica le queda grande. Eso pasó hace 20 años. O sea, no, no hay que remitirse a un conocimiento histórico profundo para saber el daño que las políticas exteriores de Estados Unidos le hicieron a un país como El Salvador. No me alargaré tanto sobre esto porque entonces sería interminable, pero muchos de esos salvadoreños que huyeron de la guerra en los años 80 se instalaron en el sur de California por razones que he mencionado antes. 
y encontraron en ese lugar un ambiente convulso en los lugares de clase media baja, de clase obrera como San Fernando, el Valle de San Fernando, la zona de Pico Junior, incluso el sur de Los Ángeles. Encuentran un ecosistema de 64 pandillas, donde había pandillas hispanas, donde había pandillas eh, mexicanas que no permitían el ingreso de nadie que no fuera mexicano, donde había pandillas boricuas que funcionaban de la misma manera, supremacistas blancos, pandillas, federaciones de pandillas negras como Bloods y Crips. Y los centroamericanos se encuentran sin poder pertenecer a ninguna pandilla a la cual integrarse o ser aceptado rápidamente. Había algunas excepciones, como por ejemplo la pandilla Barrio 18, que era heredera de una pandilla vieja formada por italianos que se llamó Clanton 14 en su momento. Pero los salvadoreños en aquel momento se juntaron en una ciudad que no entendían alrededor de un sonido, del death metal, del rock. Y empezaron a ir a conciertos. De hecho, mucho de la cosmovisión actual de las pandillas, como el tema de la bestia, por los que algunos lo confunden con organizaciones satánicas, cuando en periodismo quieren lograr un buen titular. Se debe a eso, a que a algunas canciones icónicas de aquel momento donde provenía la bestia de Beast como una figura que provenía del death metal y que las pandillas asumen, deconstruyen y vuelven a construir con un significado diferente años después. Esa pandilla de rockeros abandonada de la mano del Estado, a donde habían huido para buscar una mejor vida, se encuentra con una sola pregunta en el sur de California. La única pregunta que los salvadoreños jóvenes, muchos de ellos habían peleado en la guerra, habían sido reclutados a la fuerza o por el ejército o por la guerrilla. La única pregunta que ellos se encuentran cuando llegan al sur de California es si sabían pelear. En su ecosistema, su, lo que los rodeaba les pregunta, tú sabes defenderte, tú sabes pelear. Y ellos venían de una guerra, de una violencia mucho más extrema que la que se podían encontrar en el sur de California, responden, sí sé pelear, sí sé hacerlo. De hecho es lo único que se hace y es lo que quería dejar de hacer la Mara Salvatrucha surge como un grupo no integrado al sistema de pandillas sureñas que crece rápidamente en los años 80 en California es decir, reciben a miembros de cualquier nacionalidad aunque se acercan principalmente centroamericanos del norte algunos ecuatorianos, algunos peruanos en un primer momento y crean la pandilla Mara Salvatrucha, que terminó una década después siendo aceptada en el sistema sureño, es decir, bajo el ala de la Mexican Mafia, la gran pandilla de pandillas sureñas del sistema californiano. La, la solución que Estados Unidos aplicó a la pandilla, cuando se dio cuenta que era un grupo criminal de rápido crecimiento en el sur de California, solo existía en el sur de California, fue la misma dosis que ha aplicado a los centroamericanos desde hace, desde este momento, que fue la deportación entre el 89 y en el 94, según investigaciones de, de, de principalmente de Vin Sabanich, de Flaxo. Cerca de 4.000 pandilleros con récord activo, eh, es decir, no, 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 con, no por conducir borrachos, con crímenes, con felonis más graves, llegaron deportados a principalmente los tres países del norte de Centroamérica entre el 89 y el 94, 4.000. Los deportan a un país como El Salvador, que estaba en construcción, no teníamos instituciones, en El Salvador no había Policía Nacional Civil, había Guardia Nacional, no había Procuraduría para la Defensa de los Derechos Humanos, era un país en construcción. No había tiempo para atender a un grupo de gente entrenada en organizar y reclutar organizaciones que, de control territorial, como lo son las pandillas. Daré un salto temporal grande. El año pasado nosotros pedimos a la Policía Nacional Civil de El Salvador, vía Ley de Acceso a la Información, la actualización de cifras del número de pandilleros activos que se considera hay en El Salvador. Dije 4.000 deportados a tres países entre el 89 y el 94. Ahora mismo solo en El Salvador hay 64.000 miembros activos de pandillas, en un país de 6.5 millones de habitantes. Es decir, y ahora mismo diré otra cifra, porque solo en comparación creo yo que adquiere las dimensiones necesarias, lo dijo Sessions hace no mucho tiempo, cuando los asesinatos de 2017 en Long Island, en Brentwood y en Uniondale, si la pandilla Mara Salvatrucha estaba en aquel momento en solo el sur de California y está en 40 estados de Estados Unidos, 
y tiene cerca de 10.000 miembros. Es decir, las deportaciones han demostrado a lo largo de los años no ser la solución a un problema de creación conjunta entre Centroamérica y Estados Unidos como las pandillas. Y eso es algo que ha quedado demostrado una y otra vez, pero es como una receta podrida o como una medicina caducada que sigue dándose al paciente, con la intención de que algún día, quién sabe por qué mágica razón, empiece a funcionar. Las pandillas en Centroamérica crecieron en gran medida porque los gobiernos en aquel momento no tenían tiempo para eso. Recuerdo, en los años 90, la gran crisis salvadoreña era la crisis de los secuestros. Había mucha gente, para decirlo en términos académicos, que tras la guerra solo tenía un doctorado en fusil y no, no sabían hacer otra cosa. Habían combatido desde que tenían 12 años y habían llegado a la adultez o a la madurez con un fusil en las manos. No sabían hacer otra cosa. Se crean bandas de secuestradores. Ese es el único delito que en El Salvador se radicó hasta un 0% en los años 90, porque claro, era un delito que afectaba esencialmente a la clase pudiente salvadoreña. Se crearon dos grupos élites adentro de la Policía Nacional Civil y contra eso se bregó en los años 90. Las pandillas era algo incomprendido. Al principio las pandillas, que ahora tienen el control en los 14 departamentos de El Salvador, un país de 21.000 kilómetros cuadrados, no tenían poder ni siquiera en lo que ahora son sus centros de control principal, las cárceles. Eran, digamos, el sector con menos poder dentro de las cárceles, donde convivían con las bandas criminales que cometían estos secuestros, estos asaltos. El Estado salvadoreño, ante esta ignorancia, reaccionó haciendo dos tipos de políticas que afectaron grandemente a la gente que ahora huye del Salvador. La primera fue renunciar al espacio que por antonomasia le pertenece al Estado, que son las cárceles. No solo es un espacio de contención, sino en teoría, constitucionalmente, de rehabilitación. De vos tenés que ser capaz, no solo de controlar, sino de reconvertir a la gente. Las cárceles empezaron a dividirse desde el año 99, primero las de menores, para empezar a ser centros exclusivos de pandillas. Es decir, el Estado salvadoreño dividió a las pandillas por cárceles entregó al inicio una cárcel a la Mara Salvatrucha y una al Barrio 18 tras masacres carcelarias. Es decir, el Estado coincidió que ambas pandillas que se transforman al llegar, al llegar al Centroamérica, porque en, en el sur de California tenía un sentido que vos aplicaras lo que le llaman el sur, o corrieras el sur. Cuando entrabas a prisión había pandillas negras y había pandillas supremacistas blancas. Tenía sentido que te unieras por raza, pero cuando llegabas a El Salvador... Somos todos iguales, no, no tenía un gran sentido que dentro te unieras, entonces te uniste por nombre, defendías el nombre de tu pandilla. El Estado convino que no podían convivir dentro de las cárceles y Dios decidió separarlos, creó las universidades pandilleras. Nadie en la actualidad puede ser un miembro de la RANFLA o de la dirigencia pandillera si no ha pasado, bueno, tiene sus excepciones eso, si no ha pasado por la cárcel o ha estado en la cárcel un periodo amplio de tiempo. La entrega de las cárceles fue clave, porque permitió que las pandillas empezaran a coordinarse. Las pandillas al inicio, y cada vez menos, al menos en el, en el caso de El Salvador, el de Guatemala, según nosotros pudimos ver, era diferente, y el de Honduras también. No lo entiendan al principio como un monstruo con pies y cabezas, sino más bien como una confederación de clicas, o de pequeños subgrupos. La pandilla... Puede tener una clica como que tenga cinco muchachos con una pistola 357. O puede tener una clica grande y transnacional como la Fulton, creada en el Valle de San Fernando, que tenga un arsenal de armas de guerra y que tenga conexiones con Estados Unidos e incluso territorio en Tapachula. Es decir, ¿qué es la pandilla? ¿Qué política le aplicás a ese grupo o a ese grupo? La unión carcelaria permitió construir un liderazgo común. Y entonces las pandillas empezaron poco a poco a manejarse como organismos nacionales. Es decir, la clica del norte del país tenía contacto con la clica del occidente del país. Y eso empezó a ser muy importante a la hora de dominar territorios y expulsar gente. Lo segundo es que a partir del año, esto es de un contexto básico, a partir del año 2003 y esto principalmente a través de los gremios de transportistas públicos, eh, en El Salvador empieza a aparecer el negocio de la extorsión pandillera como el principal negocio. Es decir, te pido dinero a cambio de no hacerte nada. Es decir, te brindo seguridad a cambio, o sea, te hago un cobro a cambio de no brindarte inseguridad más bien. 
soy yo el actor que te va a hacer tener una vida insegura. Y eso hizo que por primera vez en El Salvador, en el año 2003, un presidente que murió hace dos años mientras era enjuiciado por haberse robado millones de dólares de la cooperación taiwanesa, eh, Francisco Flores, pusiera en el centro de la política de seguridad del de Salvador a las pandillas. Por primera vez, un país centroamericano ponía en el centro a las pandillas. Y él se fue a una colonia dominada por una de las pandillas y lanzó un plan con un nombre de estos que les ponen en Centroamérica, plan Mano Dura. En, en el año 2003, año de lanzamiento del plan Mano Dura, El Salvador tenía 36.6 homicidios por cada 100.000 habitantes, 36.6. Naciones Unidas dice que si algo supera la tasa de 10 por cada 100.000, tenemos una epidemia de eso. México, con toda razón, se escandaliza cuando ronda los 18 homicidios por cada 100.000 habitantes como tasa nacional. En El Salvador, este año, lo más pacífico que hemos conocido este siglo es eso, 36.6. Después del plan Mano Dura, vino otro presidente, Antonio Saca, que ahora está preso por haberse robado millones de dólares del erario público salvadoreño. Confesó su delito y ahora está en una de las cárceles que él inauguró. En el año 2009, cuando eh, y bueno Francisco Flores dejó el plan Mano Dura y Antonio Saca, en un derroche de creatividad, creó el plan Super Mano Dura. Para el año 2009, cuando Antonio Saca deje el poder, El Salvador tenía una tasa de 71 homicidios por cada 100.000 habitantes. Es decir, después de aplicar dos remedios idénticos, dos remedios represivos, y de tener desde el norte más y más deportaciones, el problema en El Salvador llega a adquirir esta cota que nos pone en el peor podio del mundo, el país con más homicidios que no tenía una guerra abierta en aquel momento. 71 homicidios por cada 100.000 habitantes. En ese momento las pandillas ya eran organizaciones nacionales. Ya conocíamos que era la RANFLE, el organismo de decisión nacional, al menos de la Mara Salvatrucha. Y esto empieza a tener control territorial y afectación que intentaré explicar muy brevemente después sobre la vida de las personas, su actividad económica, su actividad lúdica, su forma de movilidad dentro de, de un punto a otro de la ciudad. Es decir, hay gente, y esta idea la desarrollaré al final, en mi país a la que el país se le agota. No es que no quieran migrar internamente, no, no es que su verbo sea migrar, su verbo es huir. Y espero llegar a ese punto, si la gripe me lo permite. Para, para que vean, la, la, la idea de refugio fue apareciendo de nuevo en el flujo migratorio. Es decir, los centroamericanos que tras la guerra abandonan la idea de refugio y abrazan la idea de migración económica por prosperidad, tardaron años, aunque tuvieran razones para huir, Tardaron años en volverse a enterar que su verbo, o el verbo de muchos, era huir. Y se los pongo en cifras mexicanas. Si México tuvo en 2013 841 solicitudes de asilo, el 98% de Guatemala, Honduras y El Salvador, en 2015 tuvo 3.423. Y en el 2016, 8.781. Es decir, los incrementos eran de 157, 203%, un año hacia el otro año. En el año 2017 se cerró arriba de 20.000 solicitudes de refugio. Cuando hay una red aún muy precaria para comunicar el refugio en México, hay mucha gente que huye y no lo sabe, o no sabe que existe esa palabra que se llama refugio, o evidentemente esas siglas que se llaman ACNUR. El 92% viene del Triángulo Norte, perdón. Es decir, la fórmula de represión, encarcelamiento y políticas como las manos duras solo generaron que esta región se volviera a construir una vez más como una región de gente que huye, de gente que huye y que tiene relación con las decisiones que se toman acá. Las decisiones de deportación, como se volvieron a aplicar tras los asesinatos terribles de Long Island, volvieron a generar masas de migración en el año 2014, con lo que llamaron la crisis de los niños. Vaya, la naturaleza territorial de las pandillas, voy a intentar explicar esto, no lo puedo hacer con números, sino con un ejemplo de cómo son las vidas de las personas. Hizo que, voy a intentar explicar la vida cotidiana de alguien a quien se le agota la vida en El Salvador. Nosotros, por ejemplo, acabamos de ayudar a que una fuente nuestra salga a Estados Unidos. Ahora está en Las Vegas. Entró aquí con el permiso de su coyote. Esta persona, su hermano era pandillero de una de las pandillas del barrio 18. 
su hermano siendo pandillero fue testigo de una masacre policial porque hay un último elemento que incorporé al final que terminó de construir el salvador actual de la gente que huyó huyó de la zona y asesinaron a su hermano y a sus otros dos hermanos por ser estar relacionados con un pandillero ella intentaba huir en El Salvador, pero ¿hacia dónde huía? Si se movía a otra colonia de clase obrera, iba a estar controlada por las pandillas y iba a tener que explicar a la organización pandillera que gobernaba, ese es el verbo, que gobernaba su colonia, por qué había huido de ahí. Y si llegaba a otra colonia, dominada por la Mara Salvatrucha, le iban a preguntar por qué huía de ahí. Vivir con la tranquilidad de que no vas a ser asesinado esa noche en El Salvador es el esencial problema. Y hay razones creíbles para pensarlo. Es decir, aquel concepto de refugiado que aplica la legislación internacional es ya obsoleto para los centroamericanos que huyen. Pertenecer a un grupo religioso, étnico, que sea perseguido por esa razón, ha quedado obsoleto para los centroamericanos. Si, si me preguntás vivir con alguna certeza mínima de que no te van a asesinar a vos y a tu familia, ese es un grupo que componen muchos centroamericanos. Tanto que en el año 2015, el presidente de la Asamblea Legislativa de El Salvador, Norman Quijano, del partido de derecha, solicitó a la asamblea que se retirara el domicilio de los salvadoreños del documento único de identidad, porque si vos transitas pedazos del Salvador gobernados por una pandilla y tu dirección dice que vivís en un pedazo del Salvador gobernado por otra, eso te puede costar la vida en mi país. Es decir, hay gente a la que las demarcaciones formales le interesan muy poco para moverse y hay toda una nueva demarcación que esté en la cabeza de las personas de la cual, en la cual les va la vida. O sea, hay salvadoreños que podrían tomar una ruta de bus para ir a su trabajo, pero que toman cinco para evitar pasar por la colonia vecina que es gobernada por otra pandilla. La complejidad de la, de, de, del problema pandillero para resolverlo tras años de incomprensión y de ignorancia en los que sumo al periodismo, en los que asumo un mea culpa para el periodismo, que no supimos explicar a tiempo que eran las pandillas. Es complejo porque si vos, pues, aunque un cártel sea un grupo complejo y aunque Donald Trump diga que las pandillas son el, el cártel de la Mara Salvatrucha o hable en esos términos, no son grupos esencialmente económicos, tienen economías de, sub, de subsistencia. 60, una mafia de 64 mil miembros no puede ser rica. Muy difícil que lo sea, aunque tendría que tener una sofisticación criminal enorme. En el centro de las pandillas hay otro elemento, que es el de la identidad cultural. Es decir, ¿quién soy yo en este mundo? ¿Cuál es mi rol en este mundo? Y la decisión de ingresar a las pandillas la, 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 la hace la gente entre los 10 y los 15 años. Es muy difícil que luego te busquen para ingresarte a la pandilla. Es decir, ¿quién quiere ser? La pandilla no te ofrece un salario para entrar, te ofrece una nueva identidad. Querés dejar de ser, por ejemplo, el personaje de mi último libro, Miguel Ángel Tobar, hijo de campesinos pobres, nieto de campesinos pobres, y querés pasar a ser el niño de Hollywood. Vas a seguir siendo pobre, pero vamos a llenar de sentido tu vida. Vas a sentir que estás en una guerra trascendental contra otros jóvenes espejo, que son idénticos a vos que tienen la misma precariedad, pero a los que te vamos a enseñar a odiar. Y el odio, como ustedes lo saben, llena de sentido muchas vidas. El odio es esencial como motor de vida para gran cantidad, de, de gran número de grupos poblacionales. Entonces, deshacer eso a estos niveles es muy difícil. El último paso que ocurrió en El Salvador y por el que yo creo que seguirán viendo, y con esto termino, eh, gente huyendo de este pequeño país en el año 2012 en marzo cuando el primer gobierno de izquierda en la historia del país se dio cuenta de que no podía hacer descender las cifras de homicidios y así como como en Nueva York en invierno les interesa cuál va a ser el clima al día siguiente en El Salvador a nosotros nos interesa cuánta gente asesinaron el día anterior o sea, medimos qué tan calientes están los homicidios es ya una especie de número instalado en la cabeza de los salvadoreños. Cuando se dieron cuenta de que, de que no podían reducir los homicidios, el ministro de Seguridad Pública, un militar, propuso negociar con las pandillas. Y se negoció con las cúpulas pandilleras la concesión de beneficios carcelarios 
a cambio de que ellos redujeran los homicidios, es decir, trasladar a los líderes de las pandillas a una zona cárcel de menor seguridad, bajo la lógica de que no poder negociar con quien no tiene el poder. Suena una tontería, pero había pandilleros que tenían 15 años sin tocar a sus parejas, sin tener contacto humano con sus hijos. Entonces, para algunos líderes pandilleros, entrar a un penal donde había visita íntima no era una cuestión menor en aquel momento. Entonces, los homicidios se desplomaron. Llegamos a niveles como los de antes del plan Mano Dura y Super Mano Dura, a 36 homicidios por cada 100.000 habitantes. Pero cuando se acercaron las elecciones presidenciales del 2014, el gobierno de izquierda vio que la tregua era muy poco popular. Es decir, que aunque había menos homicidios, la tregua era muy impopular. Y esta es por una razón, esta es mi opinión, esto no es algo que yo haya podido mostrar. En El Salvador estamos convencidos de que la violencia se resuelve a balazos. Pero no porque tengamos algo malo en el ADN, ni porque nazcamos locos. Es porque hemos sido criados a palos. Yo soy de una generación que no conoce qué es la paz. No, no sabemos cómo ejecutar algo en lo que no hemos vivido. No, nunca he vivido yo en un país en paz. No sé qué es eso. Bueno, yo lo sé, quizás tengo el privilegio de saberlo por las burbujas en las que habito. Siendo alguien privilegiado, pero no le puedes pedir a una sociedad que no conoce la paz que opte por ella como forma de solución. No, no conocemos de eso. Es como que vayas y le pidas ahora mismo a los suecos que empiecen a matarse salvajemente. Esa impopularidad de los procesos de rehabilitación o de negociación con grupos criminales hizo que el gobierno, para ganar las elecciones presidenciales de 2014, denostara la tregua y la clausurara finalmente en un discurso del presidente electo en enero de 2015. Y a partir de ahí el problema es que en las pandillas quedó instalado un mensaje político. Los cadáveres son un activo político. Muchos muertos, mucha atención, pocos muertos, poca atención. Por eso en 2015 tuvimos aquella tasa de 103 homicidios por cada 100.000 habitantes. Uno de cada 972 salvadoreños fue asesinado ese año. Es decir, es un año en el que era difícil no conocer a, un, a alguien que hubiera sido asesinado. Entonces, ese mensaje ha quedado en, en el discurso de las pandillas y han jugado con la cifra de homicidios de salvadoreños, de clases empobrecidas, que son, como bien lo expresaban en la ponencia anterior, quienes componen la migración centroamericana han quedado como moneda de cambio han quedado como moneda de cambio ahora, cierro diciendo esto porque si no ya vi que me voy a alargar y meterme en, en berenjenales que ya no me corresponde en tiempo pero he dicho todo esto solo para abrir la discusión sobre un sentido toda esta gente que huye que ahora llega por su cuenta a estos bolsones migratorios de la frontera no, no, a veces hablamos de la cantidad de gente que huye y de cómo se acumulan y de la política para recibirlos. Esa gente no huye de, de, de países que se crearon espontáneamente, huye de, de, de decisiones políticas y administrativas de gente que tiene responsabilidad sobre la vida de esas personas. O sea, huyen de, de, de países donde hay presidentes ineptos y clases políticas ridículas y desconectadas de sus sociedades. Huyen de países con amnesia, con clases políticas amnésicas como las de este país. De eso huyen, huyen de construcciones que hombres y mujeres en el poder hicieron y que los hicieron huir. Entonces muchas veces hablamos de los refugiados y de la gente que huye, pero no decimos quién los hizo huir. Hay gente, hay nombres, hay planes, hay toda una construcción de políticas públicas que hicieron que esta gente tuviera esa vida miserable y terminar entrando aquí sin permiso de nadie. Muchísimas gracias, Oscar Martínez. Thank you. Eh, Mark, the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you to Claudio Lomnitz, to the different units at Columbia, and to CIDE for sponsoring this event. And uh, for me, it's a particular delight to be back in Earl Hall, where 
during my student days, all the uh, student organizations were headquartered and where we hatched lots of interesting actions and conspiracies and, and things like that. So that part is, is fun for me. Um, as Claudio mentioned earlier, I'm not really a student of Central American migration, uh, although I have done some work on agrarian problems and rural movements in the region. I thought I would talk to you today about uh, something that has to do very much with the texture of daily life and which if you head out to Broadway and walk 45 blocks north or take the bus, uh, you'd come to the neighborhood in Washington Heights uh, where I live, uh, which is a heavily immigrant neighborhood. It's received waves of immigrants over many generations from different places. And if there's a big uh, takeaway from uh, what I'll have to say to you, it's that a system of soft authoritarianism and a culture of fear are often created through an accumulation of small incidents, of small events. It doesn't have to be the army marching in the street. It doesn't have to be uh, something highly visible. It has a high profile. Uh, but it speaks very much to, to the kind of thing that Oscar was talking about uh, in a much graver situation. It has to do with the texture of daily life. Um, so maybe we've the, the area I'm talking about is uh, in northern Manhattan. Uh, for those of you not familiar with uh, the city, it's uh, Washington Heights goes from about 155th Street to uh, 200th Street. Inwood is a little uh, north of that. Um, and it's this neighborhood that has been an immigrant neighborhood uh, really since its inception. It was the last part of the, the island of Manhattan that had empty land. Uh, in the 1930s, uh, there were waves of refugees from Nazism uh, that moved to the area. The first building that I lived in in the, the neighborhood, uh, apart from English, the main language was German. Uh, and the residents were elderly uh, German Jews, and the fortunate ones had come in the 1930s. Uh, my neighbor across the hall, Ida, had been, had escaped uh, Nazi-occupied Vienna on one of the Kinder transport trains to Britain. Uh, another neighbor uh, down the hall had been in the Theresienstadt concentration camp, and my neighbor Frieda, who lived right above me, uh, had been a slave laborer in the factories of uh, the famous Oscar Schindler, uh, the one that Spielberg made the uh, movie about. And, and I mention this uh, not only uh, for historical perspective, but because some of the things I'm going to mention in a little while, uh, the, these friends of mine are long gone, but there are still few people of that group left in the neighborhood. And some of the things I'm going to describe have particular uh, resonance for them, not just for more recent uh, immigrants and undocumented people. Um, maybe we can go to the next one. So the, the population is roughly 200,000 people, 71% uh, uh, Hispanic, according to the last census, 17% non-Hispanic white, some African American, some Asian, some other. The foreign born population is uh, almost half, and the population with limited English proficiency is, uh, was 39% in the last uh, census. Um, maybe the next. So, Washington Heights is often imagined as a Dominican neighborhood. Uh, people say, oh, it's just like the Dominican, just like, the, the, just like Santo Domingo, pero sin palmeras. Um, <laughs> Some people call it Quisqueya Heights, Quisqueya, the, uh, supposedly the aboriginal name for the island of Santo Domingo. Um, to go down, please. Um, and linguists who, who have done studies of the language of the streets have identified at least six varieties of Spanglish that uh, vary according to generation, <coughs> national origin, time of immigration, uh, gender, uh, and so on. 
Um, and in walking the streets, one can hear not, not only the, the, these new hybrid constructions, but one can hear uh, certainly Dominicans, but also uh, Mexicans, Cubans, Ecuadorians, Central Americans, Puerto Ricans, as well as speakers of German, Arabic, Chinese, and many other languages. Um, just to give you an idea. Okay, when the election campaign was going on, um, people were, of course, the presidential election campaign in the United States, uh, 2016, uh, people were, of course, uh, often appalled by the anti-immigrant uh, rhetoric uh, from, from the Republican candidate. Um, and it was hard for many people not to take that uh, rhetoric seriously, e even before the results of the election were in. Um, I recall that on the morning after the election, and I had stayed up very late into the night watching the election return, so I was sleep deprived, and, and of course in a foul mood, um, I, I left the house very early uh, to take my youngest son to school, and we, we got on the bus, and uh, the passengers on the bus looked quite dejected, but the first thing that I saw was uh, a middle-aged man, almost certainly Latino, with a little smile on his face and a very large Trump button. And, and I mention this because uh, I was a little bit shocked by this, but it's emblematic of uh, something I think we have to acknowledge, which is that within the Latin American immigrant population and their descendants, uh, there are many people who are very politically conservative. Evangelical Christians, uh, people connected to the very large and dynamic small business sector that exists uh, in northern Manhattan. Um, so it's not, we're, we're talking about a community that is diverse, not just in terms of national origin and language and all these other things, but politically as well. Um, actually, go back just, just a minute. Um, this is just a, a, what seemed to me to be an almost spontaneous uh, expression of, of, of protest. I ran across one day when I was walking in the neighborhood, a small uh, rally, anti-Trump rally. So when I got to my son's school on that morning after the election, and I should mention that his school is one of the very few New York City public schools that is genuinely diverse across pretty much every dimension you could imagine, class, race, national origin, immigration status, disability status, family structure, everything. Uh, it's quite an amazing place. I, I got to the school with him and I found everybody gathered in the cafeteria um, and people were crying. The director, the principal of the school was crying, many teachers were crying, parents were crying. Children were crying all over the place. And we did something that usually we do every Monday morning to have a nice start to the week, which is to, to sing songs. Everybody gathers together. And, and so we sung the famous Woody Guthrie song, This Land is Your Land, in English and Spanish. Uh, the children sung folk and protest songs in English and Spanish. It's a dual language school. Um, and everybody hugged each other and went off to work or went home or, or whatever they had to do. Um, that afternoon, and, and here we, we speak to the little incidents that, that uh, come up in daily life and that uh, indicate to you that, that there's a new kind of climate. One of my son's friends came over to uh, play after school. He's a child of immigrants from New Zealand. Um, and he said to my son, so where are you all going to go live now? Trump has said that the Jews won't be allowed to live here anymore. I thought, wow, that, that's a, a very interesting thing uh, from a young child. And it, was, it wasn't said maliciously. It was said in that innocent way that children have of relaying a rumor or something that they heard second or third hand. Um, so my son was digesting this, and we talked about it and told him not to worry. 
But then he later was inquiring. He, he said uh, to his mother, um, Mommy, is Trump going to deport you back to Brazil? My wife is born in Brazil, but a US citizen. Uh, so the chances of her getting deported are virtually zero. But these are the kind of fears that are beginning to be implanted in, in, in young children's minds. Um, okay, maybe go down one. Um, a number of small incidents over the, the following months um, punctuated my everyday sense of normalcy. A Salvadoran father of uh, a couple of kids at my son's school um, started talking to me one day and then he said to me, we were talking about a meeting that was going to be there in the evening and he said to me, you know, we, we will come to the meeting but my wife and I, when we, go, when we go to the school, we always take a different route. She goes separately and I go separately, just in case uh, ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, picks one of us up, one of us will still be here to take care of the children. So this is the kind of thing that has become part of the routine of daily life for uh, vulnerable immigrants. Um, at the beginning of the fall semester in 2017, I had to explain to my students at Hunter College and the City University of New York, a public uh, university, uh, about the Trump's admin Trump administration's decision to end deferred action for uh, childhood arrivals, the DACA program or the dreamers. Um, and we know where I work that somewhere in the area of five to eight percent of the student population are, um, have, have that immigration status. So this is something that's going to be pulled out from under them. Uh, and I had to say to them, um, I know that there may be DACA students or dreamers in this room, and if there are, you are welcome here. Because they were being made to feel, all of a sudden, uh, extremely vulnerable, and uh, to have their lives ended. Uh, then, around the same time, uh, a Guatemalan woman uh, sought sanctuary in the church around the corner from where I live. Um, her two older children go to my son's school. Um, they, she can't take them there. She has to stay in the church or she'll be deported. Um, very nicely, a group of older Dominican women from the neighborhood have befriended her. They pass the day with her because essentially she's incarcerated with no end in sight, just in a church. Maybe we could play the uh, video. If, if you can't see the, the... Once upon a time, there was a girl named Dulce. She had a mom who was going to get deported because of Mr. Trump. He doesn't want people who don't have papers for the United States. New York City to go to the court. But she didn't go because she knew she was going to get sent to Guatemala. So she decided to go to a church with her three kids named Dulce, Daniela, and David. The oldest one that was Dulce knew a little bit more about what was going on, but the younger ones didn't really know that much. But actually, the youngest one is three, that is David, and the medium one is eight, and that's Daniela. So the medium one didn't know a little bit. When they got there, they were kind of scared and surprised that the church was kind of big and looked kind of scary. The ladies that worked there showed them the room that they were going to stay in. They were happy, but when it was time, their dad left. The oldest one started to cry because she was going to miss her dad, because she gets emotional easy and because she was sensitive. She cried a lot, but the ladies in the church told her not to cry. She was going to be fine, so she calmed down. She was super sad. When they were sleeping there, the kids were kind of scared, but most of the others were because she really missed her dad. She wished she was back home. 
Neither are there for six months, and the oldest girls go to school, and the baby stays home with his mom. The oldest one likes writing and reading and being with her friends. After they come from school, they say hi to their mom and go to this program called Washington Heights Choir School. In that program, they eat a little snack and sometimes go singing or do their homework. But if they don't have homework, they do projects. On Tuesday, there's a teacher who comes and plays the recorder and some other instruments. After the program, they eat while watching their tablets. Then they go to take a shower, read a book, or watch a tablet. Then they go to sleep. Now there was three birthdays in the church. The first birthday was Dulce's birthday. Dulce thought they would not do nothing for her birthday because her mom couldn't buy anything for her because she can't get out of the church. So her mom brought her downstairs into her room and people sang happy birthday, cut the cake. Kids got goodie bags, played games, and ate. The second birthday was the mom's birthday. And the third birthday was David's birthday. There was balloon piñata, sleep of candy in the piñata. There was also face masks with sticks of Mickey Mouse and cake. Listening to music, eating food, and also eating a lot of candy. David's birthday was really fun. Dulce thinks that her mom is going to get papers for the United States because what Trump is doing is not fair. Deporting people who don't have their papers like Dulce's mom. Dulce really wants her mom to get the papers because she still doesn't want to be stuck in the church. If her mom gets her papers, Dulce wants to travel everywhere. She wants to travel to Florida to go to this land and she wants more places to go to. And essentially what that means is that uh, the New York City authorities, the police, will not honor federal detainers. In other words, if the federal government orders that somebody be detained for an immigration-related offense, the New York City police force will uh, refuse to do that. And they've refused uh, several thousand such requests. Um, so immigration agents are also, uh, because this is a sanctuary city, prohibited from uh, appearing at sensitive locations, particularly schools and hospitals. Uh, but it hasn't kept them out of courthouses. Uh, immigration and Customs Enforcement is picking up people fairly regularly at courthouses. And this, of course, has a chilling effect on uh, the entire community because people who are victims of crime or who are witnesses to crime won't come forward sometimes to uh, report that. Um, one, please. Uh, the street right outside where uh, Amanda was in sanctuary was recently uh, renamed for uh, Oscar Romero. Uh, and just to relate one incident uh, which illustrates the Dominican-centric, uh, very insular character of neighborhood politics. The email announcement of, of the renaming ceremony from my city council representative, Idane Rodriguez, uh, said, and I'm quoting, uh, Monsignor Romero, born in 1917, was shot dead by a sniper on March 24, 1980, while officiating a mass in the chapel of the Divina Providencia Hospital in San Salvador, Dominican Republic. Uh, I, I sent a correction, uh, but uh, the Dominican uh, cultural nationalist politicians in my neighborhood don't like to receive that kind of thing from like, <coughs> white guys. Um, okay, another incident that uh, provoked a lot of fear, if we could just go down. Uh, we have this beautiful park along the Hudson River, and it was invaded by a group of white supremacists. Uh, not that long ago. It was just a very short clip of this.
So this was a group called Identity Europa. Uh, earlier in the day, they staged a, a demonstration with minor violence at the Mexican consulate. Uh, it's not clear that they knew they were coming to a neighborhood that was heavily immigrant with a very large uh, Jewish population as well. Um, but you can see that they hung a banner that was visible from the highway saying, stop the invasion, end immigration. And uh, lest you think that this is the only kind of thing happening like this, uh, there was another uh, demonstration of actually Polish white supremacists downtown a couple of days ago, several hundred, uh, yelling all sorts of crazy things. Uh, so th these, these kind of events are becoming more common, I think are part of changing, of, of imposing that culture of fear that, that I was talking about earlier. Um, a few days later, there was a, a big gathering of people uh, to, to reject this invasion of the park that we all use where we have picnics and so on. Um, and uh, a lot of elected officials came to this. There were priests, pastors, rabbis, imams, uh, religious uh, people present. Uh, if you could go down one. Uh, and just recently, some journalists obtained a document from the Department of Homeland Security which indicates that this very peaceful uh, neighborhood event um, attended by hundreds of people was under surveillance as an anti-Trump protest. It was on this spreadsheet that Homeland Security had. Um, go down one. Okay. Yet uh, another incident. Um, Less than a month ago, uh, right before dismissal time at my son's school, um, a truck from Customs and Border Protection pulled up on the sidewalk right in front of the gate of the school. That's where the children get out at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, it left the motor running. There was a large uh, German Shepherd uh, dog inside of it. Another Customs and Border Protection vehicle parked in the street right there. And it, it's illegal, by the way, to, to park on the sidewalk like that. Um, outside the school on that corner, there are usually at this time um, vendors selling the kids food and plastic junk, things like that. The vendors who, the ones I've spoken to are from Ecuador and Mexico, took off running as fast as they possibly could. Uh, so this was clearly an act of intimidation. Um, Go down one. When, when I first heard about this, I thought that what had attracted them to the school was an unusual event uh, that occurred a few days before that I had not been able to maintain, which um, was to celebrate the culture of the Mixteca women uh, who were mothers in school. And, and I thought it was a very unusual thing because the indigenous families in the school try very hard to keep a very low profile. It's very noticeable. They're often trying to act invisible, and all of a sudden, uh, perhaps they, they felt empowered by Yalitza Paricio or, or um, um, Baron, whatever. Um, but uh, they had this event where they were sort of out a little bit. And, and the posters were up all over that fence, and I thought maybe this is what brought the Border Patrol there. But, but it wasn't that. Uh, this is a story that came out the day afterwards from the Daily News. The, the Border Patrol people just wanted to go to lunch. That's what it was. And they couldn't find a parking spot. So they parked on the sidewalk. They went across the street into a bar. Uh, and, but they left the motor running on the car that was there. Um, so 
They surely knew that this was intimidating when people started running away as soon as they pulled up. So they're, they're not uh, oblivious to that. The principal of the school tracked them down in the bar across the street and um, according to his article in the Daily News, said something to them which possibly I'm the only one in this room that would understand. She said, go play on your own stoop. This is a very New York old time expression that, that, that people you know, from uptown even wouldn't understand. Uh, but it means, you know, get out of here, go play in your own neighborhood. Um, so the arrogance of the Customs and Border Protection people was compounded when they called the school later in the day and they said, we'd like to have an assembly with the children and the parents so we can explain what our work is and how good we really are. Okay, and, and, and I think they were told to go back to the airport, but uh, I, I don't, that, that of course never happened. Um, the next day, attendance at both schools, because there are two schools in this building, was way down. People were afraid. Uh, so they didn't go to school. And um, like a day or two after this, the, the, our congressional representative, uh, Espayat, showed up at the school. And, there, there was a lot of media there um, and uh, a number of, of people holding signs and so on. Um, a Mexican father in the school with whom I'm kind of friendly uh, said to me, I really want to be there, but I don't want to be photographed. Uh, so what he did was he took one of the, the pancartas that the kids had prepared and cut a couple of holes in it and held it on his face <laughs> and looked out like that. So the only thing they were photographing was, was the, the cardboard in front of him. Um, so there was beginning to be a little bit of pushback. Let me go down one more. Uh, a few days later, there was a more festive event without the politicians there, uh, people singing songs and so on. And, and one can see in this photograph again uh, the waves of migration and refugees and so on that, that have uh, come to this place, to New York. Uh, the, the man with the guitar there is um, Bernardo Palumbo. Uh, he's a kind of fixture on the New York Latino folk music scene, uh, who, who came in the late 70s as a, a, an exile, a refugee from the dictatorship in Argentina. Uh, so. There, there's a kind of identification, I would say, across migratory streams, across generations of migrants, uh, that at least in some cases has been uh, very powerful. Um, just a couple of things. Uh, thinking of the culture of fear, these, these are some of the signs that the, the children made uh, for these events. Mami, no quiero que me separen de ti. Mami, tengo miedo de ir a la escuela hoy. So these are the kind of things that the, the children are thinking. This is the kind of fear uh, that's being implanted in the population. And, and for somebody like me, who's lived almost all of my life in New York City and, and, and have citizenship and, and don't have to worry about deportation and so on, it, it's kind of like a background condition. It's sort of a low-grade fever or something like that. For the people that are most vulnerable and most affected, uh, it, it's, it's a really terrible sense of, of permanent deep anxiety and, and, and periodically of panic. So, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. Um, <clears throat> so, I'm going to make uh, a few comments. I'm, I, uh, I'm not someone who works on Central American migration, um, but I thought I would uh, would um, participate a bit in terms of content as well, because I am someone who's an anthropologist who's worked a fair amount on Mexican nationalism, and um, the recent disappearance in again in San Fernando, Tamaulipas. Uh, initially, it was declared as 19. Uh, it's no longer clear exactly how many they were. Um, the Ministry of Interior later said 40 um, Central American migrants again in that same area of San Fernando where there were two 
major massacres in <clears throat> 2010, and then a, mass, a massacre in 2010, mass grave discovered in 2014, uh, led me to write a, a, a piece in La Jornada that I write, to, I'll call them every other week, uh, about the problem of uh, narrative, how to tell the problem of Central American migration from the point of view of Mexico. And I'm going to try to reflect a bit on that briefly. And if I have time, I'll read also the op-ed piece that, uh, that I wrote a couple of weeks ago. So the basic problem I'm trying to, uh, that, I, that I'd like to think about a bit, is that there is no uh, national narrative in Mexico that in cases that, that, provide, that encases and provides the public with a language that can also orient uh, positive social action with regard to migrants and Central American migrants very particularly. And I want to point to a couple of historical um, <clears throat> sort of benchmark moments that I think help understand why there's such a difficulty in framing uh, the problem of migration as a political problem internally in Mexico. In the late 19th century, almost all, I guess all probably, uh, Latin American countries tried to attract uh, European migration. Mexico did too, um, but Mexico was one of the countries that was relatively unsuccessful in the attempt. As there, there, were, there were migrants who came to Mexico from Italy, from, um, from Spain, from Germany, um, in the late 19th century and early 20th century. Uh, but the numbers were no, not at all comparable to, say, Cuba or, a, <clears throat> a, or say nothing of Argentina, Uruguay, Brazil, even Chile. And the reason for those low, that low level of, quote, success in bringing in uh, Europeans um, it was to do that with the fact that Mexico had an abundant and very low paid uh, labor force on the one hand, and that lands for distribution to foreigners, good lands for distribution to foreigners, were also relatively scarce compared to other regions. So that this attempt to kind of widen Mexico and to improve Mexico racially and in terms of entrepreneurship and the like with migration from Europe was relatively unsuccessful. There was at that time in the north of Mexico, some Chinese uh, migration that was in part promoted by the uh, um, Chinese Exclusion Act uh, in the U.S., right, of the 1880s. So you had Chinese trying to come into the U.S. via Mexico as well as via Canada, and that provided um, some foreign migration uh, into Mexico at that time as well. During the Mexican Revolution and the period immediately prior, the, mo the motto Mexico para los Mexicanos, Mexico for the Mexicans, was an anti-foreign sentiment that was geared principally against giving concessions or coveted government posts to foreigners. The sentiment was also oriented against Chinese, Lebanese, and Jewish migration. And the image was then that Mexico needed to protect itself against migration, especially migrations that would gain privileges over the general population. So the image then of the foreigner, especially of the European foreigner, but even of the Jewish and, and Lebanese, or what they called in Mexico Lebanese, which meant basically of the old Ottoman Empire, Syrian, Lebanese, eh, eh, Palestinian, eh, eh, was that these groups were tending to go into the middle and upper classes. This was true even in the working classes, actually, because the history of Mexican um, industry and Mexico began industrializing in the late 19th century, was that initially they had to import, since there was no specialized uh, labor force in Mexico, they had to import workers, for example, in the beer industry from Germany, typically, or uh, <clears throat> a minor, specialized miners from England or Scotland or from the US, a, a railroad workers from the US, etc. So you had the importation also of, let's say, specialized foreign working class that also tried to keep Mexicans out of their unions uh, in order to retain, let's say, the, the comparatively high wages that these specialized foreign workers had with regard to Mexican workers. So there was, let's say, antagonism against foreigners principally as landowners, 
uh, as members of the bourgeoisie, foreign bourgeoisie, um, but also to, to, uh, at the level of um, specialized workers and in the case of Jewish, Chinese or uh, Lebanese uh, immigrants in, in, uh, because of uh, competition also at, in, in the commercial realm. Um, so uh, this Mexico para los Mexicanos led to, uh, which went through, became part of the ideology of the Mexican Revolution, uh, led to a position in Mexico that was in the end somewhat defensive against the foreigner. The, the image of the foreigner was not um, as a member of an underclass or a lower class, but rather as a competitor in the middle sector especially, and uh, to some extent as, as portions of the landowning bourgeoisie. Um, <clears throat> legislation that was implanted was often <clears throat> actually quite highly anti-foreign, and in the 20s and 30s there were um, also some limited, but nonetheless they were there, um, anti-foreign racist movements that gained some traction against the Chinese most uh, prominently, but also against the Jews and the Lebanese. <clears throat> in Mexico did, on, so you had a, a formation in the post-revolutionary period that was essentially nationalist and defensive with regard to the image of the foreigner. And also very much for a kind of regulated approach to immigration. So immigration definitely had to be kind of controlled uh, from the Mexican state. In fact, this is, there is a, a piece uh, today or yesterday, I can't remember whether it was in the Washington Post, New York Times, the Financial Times, I don't remember where I read it because I have the bad habit of reading a lot of papers because I write for the paper. But there was recently, today or yesterday, something about the lies of Donald Trump around that his recent speech around Mexican uh, policy, the current policy toward capturing Central American immigrants, where one of the claims that Trump had made was that Mexico had some of the strictest laws against migrants anywhere. And in that article, it explains how that has actually changed in the, in the past 10 or 20 years. But it used to be the case that Mexico was quite stringent with regard to its attitude toward um, a migration. It, it did develop, especially since the 1930s, a very um, uh, unusual, uh, unusually positive attitude toward uh, accepting political exiles. Um, <clears throat> this was already happening even during the period of the World War, World War I, where Mexico took in a lot of the so-called slackers, that is, Americans who were resisting the draft for World War I in the 20s. Mexico accepted a number of exiles, but especially in the 1930s, most famously, the exiles from the Spanish Civil War, but also uh, exiles fleeing Nazism, um, Trotsky, uh, you know, pe uh, fleeing various kinds of totalitarian regimes. Um, it did not, what it did not do at that period was uh, 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 change that attitude toward political exile, open it up to other forms of exile. For example, economic exile was never positively viewed by the Mexican Foreign Ministry, even in the heyday of accepting foreign refugees, like for instance, in the 1930s and in the 1940s, Mexico was not particularly open to accepting Jews, for example, who were not political exiles. So most of the, of the uh, Jews who arrived in the 30s and 40s in, in Mexico um, arrived, but were also, let's say, communists, or were also, that is, they weren't simply being targeted uh, because they were Jewish, they were being targeted also because of their political militancy. Um, <clears throat> in, <clears throat> now, in, in, this, I, I think, um, very, I mean, I think very praiseworthy attitude toward political um, refugees was continued later, and we had it, the Mexico received Guatemalan refugees after the 1954 coup. It received refugees from, uh, from Haiti at a certain, certain uh, point, points in time, and from the Caribbean more broadly. It received refugees from Brazil after the coup in Brazil. It received refugees from Chile after the coup in Chile in 73, from Argentina after 76, etc. So the politics toward 
uh, uh, making Mexico a political haven was quite developed, but the idea of Mexico opening up more broadly to immigration was actually quite stringently patrolled as part of the ideology that came out of the Mexican Revolution. Um, a second point uh, is to do with Mexico's attitude towards its own emigration to the United States, which I think in the 20th century, which I think has been characterized or was characterized by a lot of inconsistency. There were always sectors of society, Mexican society, and sometimes portions of the government as well, that um, <clears throat> felt at some level that those who were leaving were insufficiently patriotic and even Mexico's border regions and borderlands were often represented, at least until I would say the 1980s, as um, um, a little bit suspect from the point of view of the nationalist barometer because of Americanization, the Americanization of the Spanish language. This is a process that actually emerges along with the construction of the US-Mexico border, particularly in the West. You see that even in the 1890s. Uh, it's, I mean, to me, it has some comical aspects, like for instance, governors of Sonora <clears throat> in the 1890s, early 1900s, where you have the emergence of these new border towns along, uh, along the Western uh, border, uh, which emerged along with the railway. Those, those towns didn't exist before, would not have existed without the without the, the, uh, the border, um, making it illegal to use, for example, um, inches and feet so that the metric system in Mexico was nationalized and all of a sudden it became a very me Mexican thing to have the metric system. <clears throat> so quite interesting and sort of funny if you think about it. Obviously, the metric system is a quite recent invention. It was brought into Mexico with a lot of conflict in the middle of the 19th century, and the traditional systems of measurement were the old Spanish systems of measurement, which are not that different from inches, feet, uh, etc., bushels and the like. Um, the Spanish language was also nationalized along the border, right? Speaking Spanish became very important because there were too many signs that were in English on the Mexican side. So curiously, um, there was a lot of anxiety from the start around the degree of Mexicanness of the border, and in some way there was a much more intense national identity politics around the border and vis-a-vis -vis the Mexican migrants uh, than there was for anybody else. Like um, I did among my, the first pieces of fieldwork that I did when in the 70s in Mexico was in rural Veracruz. And I remember, so I'm not that old, I'm old, but I'm you know, still here. Um, um, but I remember and I witnessed, like the Protestants, I can bear witness, um, to meeting people who weren't very clear about who the president of Mexico was a president of, right? Um, because Mexico has the ambiguity of Mexico City being called the same thing, Mexico as the country. So I've heard say, el presidente de allá de México. In other words, the president of Mexico City. I heard that say in Veracruz, not on the border, okay? Um, but in Veracruz, nobody was anxious about whether Veracruz was or was not part of Mexico. But there is a lot of anxiety about nationality around the borderlands and uh, Mexican immigration to the US. In, so Mexican political rhetoric, I think, has generally been unprepared for waves of migrants that could constitute or engross an underclass. Um, all of the defensive Mexico para los Mexicanos was constituted around the defense of projected or imagined middle class positions or upper class positions. It's also ideologically unprepared to view itself as a territory of transit. Okay, so all of the more, more than 100 year history that we have of migration from Mexico to the US was not a history of having other people use Mexico as a road into, uh, into the United States. Whereas now we have migrants from all over the place and many of them um, actually concentrating in border cities uh, like El Paso or uh, Tijuana where you have 
communities of Haitians, communities of Cubans, communities of Venezuelans, migrants coming in from Africa, from Asia. I've met in Mexico City, to my surprise, taxi driver from um, in what used to be, uh, from uh, what used to be called East Pakistan. What do you call it? Bangladesh. Bangladesh. Um, so, and I, you know, was, I, he looked Mexican, then he didn't speak any Spanish. So, where are you from? Where are you from? And he says, I'm from Bangladesh. I said, how the hell did you get here? Well, there are about 170 of us here right now, in Mexico City. Okay, so, um, yeah. um, uh, but of course, the bulk of the migrants that are being, that are there and now are from, uh, from Central America. We're seeing, along with this, um, at least some flashes, some quite disturbing flashes of anti-immigrant rhetoric coming out of Mexico that we're used to seeing only out of the United States. And that's presenting a nationalist problem because we're used to American racism. And Mexico has always wanted to corner the market of anti-racism with regard to the United States. Uh, you know, Mexico had the uh, free, you know, the emancipation, slavery emancipation in Mexico was very early. And because Mexico had a war with Texas and the US, um, in, <clears throat> the question of lynching was seen as an American thing rather than a Mexican thing. Slavery is an American thing rather than a Mexican thing. Jim Crow is an American thing rather than a Mexican thing. Uh, so racism against immigrants is an American thing rather than a Mexican thing. And lo and behold, like last November, this is famous, it came out all over in the world press, the mayor of Tijuana, Juan Manuel Gastelum, who gained Donald Trump's praise, that's why it made, uh, um, it declared greeting the caravan of Honduran migrants that these were not migrants, immigrants, but a bunch of vagrants and potheads, vagos y marihuanos, and then famously claimed that los derechos humanos son para los humanos derechos, which I would translate roughly as human rights are only for proper or upright or legal humans. Right? Um, this is in Mexico. Mm -hmm. Um, an anti-immigrant rally, maybe not that different from the one that we just scarily saw in uh, Washington Heights, was also held there in Tijuana, although there were also pro-immigrant rallies that were held. But this is happening right now in Mexico, and we can expect, I think, more of this if we don't start developing ways of thinking and talking about the uh, the new situation around immigration that puts immigrants in some kind of national framework, is my opinion. Um, so, um, oh, in the meantime, over the last the past 20 or 30 years, border crossing of illegal substances and of undocumented migrants has been uh, subjected to a process that Natalia Mendoza, who's going to be speaking uh, at the end of today, along with Fernando Montero as doing a, as a kind of thinking through what has happened in the day, has dubbed cartelization. And that consists of the privatization of access to and management of border crossing in particular, and mo the, its monopolization by organized crime. So Central, mi Central American migrants have become the principal merchandise in the human traffic industry. Uh, along the border and actually through Mexico. So there, and that yet though there's no storyline, no organized reaction against either the quotidian abuses of migrants as they cross through Mexico, rape for instance. You can see um, there was recently, a week or two ago in the New York Times, an actually quite strong and good uh, documentary reportage about rape and sexual assault of Central American migrants as they come through Mexico and also in Texas, in Southern Texas. And they cite uh, a survey done by Doctors Without Borders that found close to 30 percent, that 30, close to 30 percent of the Central American women that they surveyed <clears throat> had suffered sexual assault in their, in their odyssey. There is no narrative about this in Mexican public discourse as of yet or truly around their dis the disappearance and slaughter of Mexican migrants. It's worth meditating 
that the only storyline around mass murder in Mexico that has managed to generate truly massive repudiation is the one that echoed, however improbably, the student massacre of 1968. The Ayotzinapa massacre, which has been represented from quite early on as a massacre orchestrated, quote, by the state against, quote, the students. This is the only massacre that has actually managed to generate a wide, broad-based, broad-based repudiation in a country that is full of massacres. And uh, the massacres of Central Americans in particular are very difficult to assimilate and to mobilize around politically. Um, and that's why this recent San Fernando episode is so disturbing because the fact that it occurs in the same vicinity um, as the, the 2010 assassination of 72 migrants, which by the way, the, the, the Ayotzinapa massacre is famous for being, quote, 43. There are issue, interesting issues to do with numbers in, in the problem of rallying in Mexico. So the 43 became uh, uh, students uh, of Ayotzinapa killed in Iguala became a rallying cry while well, it was practically impossible to enumerate, actually, any other particular massacre, even the San Fernando, the first San Fernando massacre, which had a, a very clear number uh, of, of uh, victims. And then subsequently in 2014, they found again in San Fernando a mass grave with 193 Central American uh, migrants buried there. And now we have again, a, a couple of weeks ago, the, um, the disappearance of initially 19 mi migrants, which now seem to be 40. We don't know where those migrants are. Um, the, uh, the government has, uh, has uh, said that there is the possibility that they were abducted in order to be um, moved across the border, but that explanation doesn't sound uh, very convincing and it doesn't seem to have been borne out yet. There was an article by Aida Hernandez in La Jornada about a week ago um, saying that in fact the families of these migrants have not been contacted by the, the, these disappearers, have not been contacted by them. So it doesn't sound all that hopeful. Now, developing a new narrative around migrants in Mexico both about migrants crossing through Mexico to arrive to the United States and about migrants who stay willingly or unwillingly and who will be competing for working class jobs is a major challenge for Mexican society today. Mexican nationalist rhetoric has historically been contrary to migrants and to migration. Its self-image is that of a country that sends workers to the United States and Mexico and not a country that is wealthy enough to receive migrants. And it's in a conundrum wherein it cannot simply provide protection to migrants as they pass through to the United States because of the international pressure with the United States. So um, we saw in Jose Moya's um, presentation in the morning, those figures of Mexican deportation of Central Americans, which are actually astronomical, right? So the Mexican role in, and in, in doing the work of the Border Patrol has been very, very robust. It can't actually not do that given the terms of its relationship with the United States, even in this new government. Um, <clears throat> now, in the early 20th century, and this is a note here as an anthropologist, um, Franz Boas, who is the founder of the Department of Anthropology here at Columbia, <clears throat> developed a close critique of racism against migrants in the United States, of race and of racism against migrants in the United States. His principal Mexican student, Manuel Gamio, um, <clears throat> was a uh, one of the ideologues of Mexican nationalism during, the, during and after the Mexican Revolution. And he, Mangamio used some of uh, Boas's ideas, although not as much as he claimed, actually a lot of, I don't want to get into Gamio, but, um, but he used some of Boas's ideas, and particularly some of the general spirit about kind of cultural specificity and cultural relativism 
in order to create an image of the nation, a, a, and of the nation as a mestizo nation, but of the Mexican nation as a mestizo nation, understood as being composed of very specific racial and a, cultural inputs. Uh, now, it seems to me that that effort, which was so successful, led by Gamio and others in Mexico, of creating a national image that was a racialized national image, um, <clears throat> is right now a big problem. And in, in some way, uh, I think that Mexico's immigration situation today maybe needs a bit more Boas and less Gamio, to be honest. Uh, the situation in Mexico today calls for uh, the kind of critique, uh, more contemporary evidently, but the kind of critique of race and racism that Boas was developing rather than giving substance to racial substance to an idea of the nation, which was the great achievement of Mexico's nationalism in the 20th century. Um, and I'll conclude by reading the the piece that I wrote for uh, La Jornada right after this uh, San Fernando disappearance, which was uh, two weeks ago. Hay mucho de qué avergonzarse respecto de la forma en que la sociedad mexicana ha procesado la matanza de los estudiantes de Yotzinapa. Se encuadraron los sucesos en el modelo de la represión de 68 con calzador, aunque hayan sido bien diferentes. Luego se procedió a la memorialización de cada uno de los desaparecidos y a negarnos a aceptar su probable muerte. Vivos se los llevaron, vivos los queremos. Hace unos meses me invitaron a dar una conferencia en la unidad de Iztapalapa de la UAM en el marco del cincuentenario del 68. El encuentro comenzó con un acto solemne en que se pasó lista con los nombres de los 43 desaparecidos. El auditorio estaba de pie y decía presente después de cada nombre. Para mí, el ritual tuvo algo de siniestro. Recordábamos a cada uno de los normalistas desaparecidos, pero no pronunciamos siquiera un nombre de las decenas de muertos que aparecieron en las 18 fosas clandestinas que se hallaron en la propia Iguala cuando la Procuraduría General de la República buscaba cuerpos de estudiantes. Es como so, si solo un estudiante martirizado por, entre comillas, el Estado, mereciera ser recordado. Las noticias de feminicidios se suceden una tras otra, sin pena ni gloria. Aparecen entierros clandestinos como si nada. El 13 de febrero pasado hallaron una fosa con 69 cuerpos en Colima. No pasó nada. El día anterior... <coughs> eh, El día anterior, 12 de febrero, una madre de desaparecido encontró una fosa clandestina en Tamaulipas con 500 caráveres. Nada. La noticia pasó por la opinión pública, esto es este año, by the way. Este, la noticia pasó por la opinión pública como un fantasma. ¿Alguno de esos 500 se ha hecho presente en algún acto público? Nos importan los mitos, pero la historia es otra cosa. Esa nos interesa bastante poco. El 68 ha sido convertido en un mito, Ayotzinapa parecía repetirlo y por eso nos importó, pero solo por eso. Anteayer apareció de nuevo como un breve fantasma. <coughs> Otra noticia, 19 centroamericanos fueron levantados, secuestrados de un autobús en las cercanías de San Fernando, Tamaulipas, otra vez. En 2010 fueron 72 centroamericanos levantados y asesinados con una crueldad indecible. En 2011 encontraron una nueva fosa en el lugar con 193 cuerpos de migrantes. Ninguno fue declarado presente en las conmemoraciones del 68 a las que asistí. Nadie conoce sus nombres ni sus historias. Nadie marcha con sus retratos. Esto es en México, evidentemente. En Centroamérica sí. En Nueva York tuve la oportunidad de conocer al padre y a la madre de uno de los, de los jóvenes que, fue que fueron asesinados en San Fernando en 2010. Eran migrantes indocumentados, gente de trabajo. Ahora buscaban aislar, as asilarse en Estados Unidos y su abogada me contactó para dar testimonio sobre los riesgos que podían enfrentar si los deportaban y regresaban a El Salvador. Su historia es desgarradora. 
Era una pareja joven y bien parecida, humilde e inteligente. Se habían venido a Estados Unidos a trabajar y habían dejado a su hijo en su pueblo al cuidado de los abuelos. Cuando el hijo entró a la secundaria, lo empezaron a intimidar los pandilleros de las maras, o se unía a ellos o tendría que soportar un martirio diario. De acuerdo con los abuelos, la joven pareja se decidió a traer el muchacho a Estados Unidos. Le pagaron a un coyote del lugar y el chico emprendió el viaje. Lo levantaron en San Fernando y lo asesinaron junto a 68 compañeros en unos actos de un sadismo imperdonable. Me mostraron foto del chico. Era un muchacho de unos 15 años con una cara limpia y bondadosa, un hijo amado. A ese chico lo mataron los Zetas sin que él les hubiera hecho ni negado nada. Así de fácil. Matar es ya parte integral de una economía de derechos de piso y de paso, de carne y de drogas, de secuestro. Hace unos días el New York Times publicó un reportaje acerca de las violaciones de mujeres centroamericanas en la frontera. El tema es un escándalo y una vergüenza. El reportaje sirve, cita una encuesta parcial realizada por Médicos Sin Fronteras que calcula una, que una de cada tres mujeres centroamericanas que cruza México hacia Estados Unidos sufre un asalto sexual. Muchas de ellas son también violadas del lado tejano de la frontera. Sus asaltantes no han sido siquiera identificados, desde luego que no son procesados, ni siquiera se habla del asunto. Muchas mujeres son encerradas en casas donde son violadas en múltiples ocasiones por quienes las contrabandean. Eso es también México, un país donde los migrantes centroamericanos van desprotegidos. Ahora desaparecieron a otros 19. ¿Por qué? ¿Para qué? ¿Quién sabe? Los migrantes de Centroamérica pasan por México como fantasmas. Sus, no, sus nombres poco nos importan. Sus derechos humano, humanos son también ilusorios. Su martirio es irrelevante. A veces pareciera que si no entran en la mitología de la nación, ni existen ni importan. Gracias. Can people hear me if I talk without a microphone? No. Okay. All right. Well, then we'll take the microphone. Thank you. First of all, I see that there are um, several people acampados in the hallway. Um, if, if there are additional chairs next to you, could you raise your hand that are empty um, so that people who maybe don't have a seat could find one and so their legs don't all fall asleep? Um, so feel free to come in if you would like to. Otherwise, the carpet may be comfortable. So... If you, okay, got everybody? Please All right. come in. All right. Um, so I want to begin this talk by taking the room to a particular node on the route that migrants take from Central America. And this node of the viaje is a detention center in South Texas, um, in the small town of Dilly, Texas, located about uh, an hour and a little bit south of San Antonio. And this detention center isn't just any detention center. It's actually the largest immigration detention center or jail in the United States, in this country of immigration gulags. This is the single largest facility with the largest number of beds. Um, and the facility's official name is the South Texas Family Residential Center, which is an arresting euphemism for uh, what it is. This is, in fact, a jail that detains migrant families. Um, and when I say families, and when I'm gonna actually talk about that category a little bit later, um, what, what uh, the family in family residential center refers to is, um, is mothers uh, with their minor children. Critics call this detention center <coughs> baby jail. And I've visited uh, baby jail four times um, since 2016, most recently 10 days ago. Um, I was there um, with a group of my students. Um, I took nine undergraduate students from Barnard and Columbia um, who are in the audience with us here today. Thank you for coming. Um, and we went as part of a class that I'm teaching called Seeking Asylum, History, Politics, and the Search for Justice on the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, while we were there, we were working under the auspices of a pro bono legal project. Um, my students were translating, serving as translators, serving as legal assistants, providing basic um, know your rights information to migrants detained at the center, um, explaining to the women there how uh, asylum law, this Kafkaesque uh, system of asylum works, 
and helping them to understand what parts of their extraordinarily complex life stories and their stories of migration matter for the purposes of, uh, of asylum law. So the students were helping women to understand which part of their complex narrative is gonna be legible to um, government authorities in the United States. So I wanna bring some reflections with you, uh, to you here today from Baby Jail. Um, and some reflections based on my experience or perceptions as a historian of childhood, which I'll talk about momentarily. Um, and I do hope we, that we have time for Q&A. I know that we've run over on this session, but I hope we have time for Q&A. And I particularly like to encourage my students to um, participate in the Q&A because I think they have um, a unique perspective and have witnessed a lot of really um, critical things uh, during our trip there. So Baby Jail was born in 2015 in the wake of the so-called surge of Central American families of 2014. Um, since that time, the um, composition of the jail has, has reflected the vicissitudes of hemispheric and global migration. Overwhelmingly, the population of Baby Jail, since its founding up until now, is dominated by uh, migrants from the Northern Triangle, but there are also small numbers of Mexicans, um, Nicaraguans, Venezuelans at certain moments, <coughs> Cubans, Haitians, Brazilians, Congolese, Romanians, Afghanis. Um, so you can sort of trace um, waves of, of migration and, and over time, at least over the last five years, um, by looking at the composition of um, this um, center. So I wanna help you to uh, visualize what a baby jail looks like, because um, it's not obvious. Um, the facility, rather than being a cement building with bars on the windows, which is maybe the vision that we might have of a jail, is actually comprised of a collection of trailers. And these trailers are plunked down helter-skelter in the middle of a large dusty field on a country road, um, right down the way from a state prison. Um, this baby jail, this, this detention center, was constructed in less than three months by um, a Core Civic, which is a private for-profit prison um, company, the largest in the country, which received a $1 billion no-bid contract from the U.S. government to construct a detention center, especially for families. So as you might imagine, uh, Dili is, this detention center in Dili is a truly surreal place. Um, imagine two parts Fort Leavenworth Penitentiary mixed in with one part Plaza Sesamo. Um, women and children inmates are given uh, uh, uniforms, but these are not, again, the uniforms that you might picture in your head when you think of a jail uniform. Uh, the uniforms are actually, actually consist of bright, solid colored shirts and sweatshirts, fuchsia, yellow, turquoise, blue jeans, colorful t-shirts with um, sometimes the moms and kids have matching laces. Um, the facility has a playground that in the many months, long months of summer bakes in the Texas sun. It has a uh, trailer that is a school, which is at least in theory open several hours a day for uh, the children detained there. Um, and the residential areas, the pods that the women live in, are divided up into areas with uh, names like Mariposa Azul and uh, Loro Rojo. Um, but the anodyne branding aside, this is a jail. The facility is surrounded by high fences, by floodlights, by guard stations, um, and from the road it's actually kind of indistinguishable from the state prison just down the way. Um, inside, women wear ID badges in order to move around between trailers. Um, and at night, guards make their rounds and shine their flashlights into the faces of sleeping uh, residents. And they chase children who have moved from their own bunk bed to sleep with their mothers. They chase the children out of their bed back in, because of course, if you're taking inventory, you need to know that everybody is in their proper bed. Um, so baby jail is emblematic, I think, of a critical characteristic of the so-called border crisis today. And I'm going to refer to the border crisis, um, but I do so hesitatingly and only because I don't have a better language to talk about it. I am well aware of the politics of calling it a border crisis. I'm well aware of how um, that word has been used politically, um, but I tried border event, border uh, activity, acontecimiento. Um, so I'm going to call it a crisis because I think it is a crisis, not necessarily in the way, however, that the Trump administration wants us to believe it's a crisis. So I want to talk about how baby jail is emblematic of a critical characteristic of the border crisis today, and that is the fact that it involves large numbers of children. 
Um, according to uh, the statistics of um, Customs and Border Protection um, just this past month, um, CBP took into its custody some 40,000 children. So let's think about that number for a second. Um, Mark made reference to kinder transport, the kind of one of the most famous um, historical instances of child migration um, in the 20th century, um, in which uh, Jewish children were spirited out of, um, out of Germany um, and uh, sent to primarily to Britain. That um, historical migration involves something like 10,000 children over the course of, um, I think, a year or more. Um, we're talking about 40,000 children over the course of a month here, okay? Um, so, of course, the, this distinctive demographic composition of Central American migration today is widely discussed and recognized. We are often reminded by CBP and by the media here in the United States that when we're talking about um, Central American migrants, um, you know, the, the kind of distinctive feature of this migration flow is that it involves unaccompanied minors on the one hand and families on the other. Um, but I want to clarify what is meant by family and how the U.S. government defines family. It counts something called unaccompanied minors, that is children who come not accompanied by a, a parent, but they also uh, count something called family units. Um, but the U.S. government's definition of a family unit is different perhaps than uh, what you might consider to be a family. Um, a family unit in, does not refer to a husband and wife together or a pareja, right? It does not refer to, say, two adult siblings. It does not refer to an aunt, an uncle, and some nieces and nephews. Um, a family unit refers specifically to one or more children traveling with one or more parents. So family is about a child parent uh, um, a, a group or, or a couple. Um, that is to say, family is distinguished by the presence of a minor child in that family unit. Without a minor child, it's not a family, okay? Um, so drawing back, we could say that this migration is characterized then by two kinds of child migrants, unaccompanied child migrants and accompanied migrants, right? Um, and today, families and unaccompanied minors, this, this group um, of children as well as adults traveling with children, now ex uh, significantly exceeds um, adults traveling on their own. Just to cite one recent statistic, again from the CBP, um, 43,000 people um, were apprehended traveling as a family unit or an, as an unaccompanied minor, 43,000, versus 23,000 as single adults. So we're talking about a very uh, particular demographic characteristic in which children are, um, uh, are, are, are predominant. And so when we talk about Central American border migration today, we're also talking about a child migration event, not just the Central American migration, but a child migration. And I think that that fact is central to understanding um, both the policy responses on the part of the US government, um, as well as the broader politics of migration and how migration in this, in this migratory crisis slash event is being talked about um, in the United States today. Um, so this administration has, of course, been invoking a border crisis since before it ever even came to office, not particularly credibly, because as of course we know, um, apprehensions remain at, despite recent uptick, remain at historic low, historically low levels. More credibly, perhaps, is the administration's invocation of crisis to, um, to refer to the child part of this um, story. In recent weeks, we've heard border officials point to the humanitarian crisis engendered by the arrival of large numbers of families, i.e. children, at the border. We don't know what to do with them. Um, what makes this phenomenon a crisis then, I think, is that it challenges ideas about who migrants are or who migrants should be. Historically, of course, on the US-Mexico border, the paradigmatic migrant has been the adult, young, male laborer, right? And the system of border apprehension and the system of border detention has been set up with that figure in mind. So in talking about a humanitarian crisis caused by child migration, there's an implicit assumption that there is something unusual or exceptional or problematic about child migration. And I want to make that, um, that, that assumption explicit. So let me pause briefly to say here that, um, and I think we've all, we've all introduced ourselves with varying kinds of caveats. I'm a journalist, I'm a historian of X, but not of Y, so here's my caveat. 
I'm a, I'm a Latin American historian, but I am not a historian of Central America, nor am I a historian of migration. I am, however, a historian of childhood, um, and my reflections come from thinking about this problem through that perspective. So um, probably those of you who are not historians in the audience are perhaps going hist history of childhood, like what the hell, that's a thing. Um, it is a thing. Um, I won't go into what it is exactly, but, but, but let me give you a brief, um, a, a, a brief idea. Um, it has become a commonplace in social scientific and, and academic circles in general to say that gender and race are social constructs. That is to say, a category like gender or race has no, um, no existence outside of the social meanings that we ascribe to it. Historians of childhood would say the same thing about childhood. Childhood is a category, an empty signifier into which we pour social meanings. And we have a whole series of assumptions about what chi a child is, about what children should do, about how they should be protected, about how they are innocent and vulnerable, about how they have certain, they should have certain inalienable rights to certain kinds of protections and resources. Um, and those um, assumptions shape how we think about children in general, um, and and, and I would argue how we're thinking about um, this migration event. So I want to think about contemporary Central American <coughs> migration as an instance of child, of child migration specifically, to think about, um, and to think about uh, how thinking about child migration helps us explain better what is going on. Um, I want to think about the work we might call it the, the work, the political work that childhood does in discussions about migration. Um, and I want to think about the ways that child migration makes possible certain policy responses and political framings, but also forecloses other possibilities. Um, this is a story about what childhood allows to make, uh, it makes possible, but also what it forecloses. But let me stop back, uh, step back for just a moment from that kind of abstract discussion and ask very briefly, why are children coming in seemingly unprecedented numbers today at the border? Is this unusual and exceptional? Has the paradigmatic migrant in fact shifted? Um, and is that for good? Um, I don't know if I can answer that question, but let me give you a couple of, of, of ideas. Um, those of you who work uh, um, in Central America and on um, Central American migrants are, of course, very familiar with this story. Um, but in the Dili uh, detention facility um, last week, we heard countless stories about the unique dangers, first of all, that children face in the Northern Triangle, young girls recruited as gang girlfriends, young boys recruited into the, into the gangs. Um, Oscar made a reference to the, the youth of recruits. Um, uh, so children face, I think, unique dangers, um, and that ex in part explains why they're migrating in large numbers. Um, it is also the case that gangs, uh, when gangs threaten and extort families, they very often target and threaten children, right? Children, again, childhood, childhood has a particular set of meanings and a particular set of associations. What better way to extort a father or a mother or an aunt or an uncle than to threaten to uh, fill their child with lead, which is one of the things that I heard um, from a, a mother uh, during one of my times in, in Dili. Um, so Chile or Chile, Children are a particular kind of booty, you might say, in the, 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 this game, this, this, this performance of extortion. Um, children are also um, coming because they're being removed from situations of domestic violence. We talked to many women um, in Dili who were fleeing violent um, eh, parejas. I think that's an under-discussed part of this migration phenomenon, um, gender-based violence and domestic violence. Um, many children were themselves victims of domestic violence or witnesses to it and were fleeing with their mothers as part of a, you know, a situation of, a, of, a, of domestic violence. Um, so in short, and this is not uh, surprising to anyone here, the changing composition of migration flows um, and the presence specifically of children in those migration flows speaks to the changing drivers of migration, right? Um, we all know that. Um, we could add that another reason uh, for the presence of children among these migration flows is frankly that US law incentivizes migrants to travel with children. And I'm gonna talk about that momentarily and the ways that um, an adult traveling with a child will be treated differently than an adult traveling without a child. So the presence of children, in other words, speaks to, I think, how hardening border uh, enforcement has spurred creative adaptations, frankly, um, and produced new strategies of mobility on the part of both traffickers and migrants. 
Um, and among those strategies um, is the uh, accompanying one with a child, right, in order to um, gain entry and begin the asylum process. At the same time, it seems to me that neither the prevailing uh, conditions in Central American countries nor the peculiarities of US law and policy um, can fully explain what's going on. And that's because um, child migration is not just happening um, at the US-Mexico border and doesn't just involve Central American children. It is, in fact, a global phenomenon. And here's where we might take Jose Moya's cue to deprovincialize our vision, to pull back out from the hemisphere, um, and to recognize that what is being labeled at the US border as special or exceptional or unprecedented, namely the arrival of all these children, is, in fact, increasingly common the world over. According to the United Nations um, HCR, the High Commission on Refugees, over half, over half of the 22.5 million refugees worldwide, over half are under age 18. According to UNICEF, uh, the global number of refugee migrant and migrant children moving um, alone has reached a record high in the world. Um, so we're talking about you know, children from Syria and Afghanistan, children from various parts of Africa. Um, children were in a prominent uh, presence in the so-called jungle of Calais, the uh, refugee camp that Jose um, uh, referenced earlier. So it su suggests perhaps that maybe the problem is not that children are exceptional migrants, but that we need to shift our thinking about who a migrant is and our, and our notion of the para paradigmatic migrant. But I want to shift now my comments from thinking about the causes of child migration to thinking about the effects of child migration. Um, uh, Claudio mentioned that the, in his opening remarks, um, he, he, he uh, put it very, very well, uh, he invoked the political productivity of migration. And I think child migration is extraordinarily politically productive. Child migration has produced new institutions, it's produced new policies, and it's produced new discourses. As an example of a new institution produced by child migration, we have baby jail itself, right? The detention, special detention centers, these bizarro Kafka-esque places of penitentiary slash, slash plaza sesamo that are specifically designed for children. An example of a new policy produced by child migration is the zero tolerance policy of family separation last summer, which I will talk about momentarily, briefly. Um, and it's produced new discourses about um, about migration. So for example, we have the Trump administration framing migration today um, and child migration as an instance of child trafficking. That's a very particular way of thinking about and framing migration, right, as trafficking, um, that is produced by the fact that there are so many children. Um, and it's uh, obviously a, f a framing that I don't agree with, and I'll talk about that momentarily. Um, but if child migration has been productive of institutions and discourses and policies, I'd also argue that ultimately it has constrained in really fundamental ways the hand of this administration. It has not necessarily discouraged the boundless cruelty and lawlessness and incompetence of the Trump administration, but it has frankly constrained um, its power to act against migrants in the ways that it wishes to. So we have in recent weeks the, the Customs and Border Patrol dwelling on this idea of a humanitarian crisis at the border, that we just don't know what to do with these children, we don't have proper resources to deal with them and medical care, et cetera. I want to argue that the, the real crisis is perhaps not a humanitarian one, but rather the fact that these children uh, represent a legal and political conundrum for this administration. The crisis at least from the point of view of the, of the administration, is a, is a legal and political one. Let me explain what I mean by that. In fact, there are very powerful legal restraints that tie the hand of the administration when they deal with children and when they deal with adults who are traveling with children. One of those constraints, one of the key um, constraints, involves the detention of children. Now, as we know, detention is a central pillar of this administration's immigration policy. The day after the Trump, uh, the, the elections, the uh, stock prices of private prison corporations soared uh, in anticipation of how well they were gonna do under this um, administration. Um, this, system, this is a system um, that thrives. We have a, you know, an immigration gulag uh, in this country and it's a system that thrives on for-profit detention. There are today more adults in immigration detention than ever before. 
However, that policy doesn't work so well when it comes to children. And the reason is the following. In the 1990s, there was a little known legal settlement um, uh, known as the Flores decision, which stated that children cannot be detained for more than 20 days. Now, the Trump administration has violated, as did the Obama administration for that matter, um, has violated that, um, uh, um, that agreement right and left, yet nevertheless, that is the law in the books and that constrains what the administration can do. Children cannot be detained um, for more than 20 days, which means that at least if you're gonna keep their, the parent and child together, you can't detain their parent either. That's how we get to family separation, right? So the fact that children cannot be detained presents a huge problem, and one that the Trump administration has attempted repeatedly to challenge. Um, so far, I would argue unsuccessfully. Um, or I wouldn't argue, I, I, th I think that's true. It, ha it hasn't been successful in, in, um, in challenging uh, this, this legal settlement. You cannot put families in jail indefinitely in the way that you can put single adults in jail indefinitely. And again, from the point of view of the Trump administration, that's a problem. Um, now, as important as the legal constraints that child migrants pose, I would argue are the political or symbolic or discursive constraints that child migration poses. In a word, children represent a sympathetic population in a way that adult migrants cannot and probably will not. Public opinion has been a powerful break on what this administration can do um, and that has to do with the symbolic and cultural politics of childhood. Family separation is a case in point. Last summer, of course, the uh, administration announced this catastrophic policy that it was going to start separating uh, systematically, it was already doing this, but systematically separating parents and children coming over the border. Um, there was a, as we all witnessed, a not just a national, but indeed an international um, uh, spark of outrage um, and, um, you know, members of the public were outraged at the prospect, prospect of the government willfully and deliberately harming children as part of its immigration policy. And lo and behold, the administration was for first, first, forced first to lie and say we, weren't, we actually aren't, there is no policy of separating children, which Bridget Nielsen, the head of DHS, actually got up and said that. Um, and then um, when that didn't fly, they were forced to rescind the policy, right? Um, Likewise, the recent deaths of two uh, Guatemalan children in CPB, CBP custody uh, in recent months sparked public outrage. Um, and it caused an influx of resources um, and new procedures and medical screenings and all of this, this kind of stuff. Does anybody know how many adult migrants have died in US custody in recent months? Because I have no idea. And Maybe you'd have no idea either. And there's not, that's not surprising. But we do know that two children, two Guatemalan children, some of you probably remember the names of those children, the circumstances of their death. That's because we care about children dying in, in custody in a way that we don't care about um, adults. And I think that speaks to the symbolic politics of this and the constraints imposed by um, the fact that these, these migrants are children. Likewise, the detention of families has become a cause celeb. We've heard about children in cages. We saw, witnessed those, those uh, extraordinary photographs of the tear grassing of migrants at the border and the mom with her, her toddler in diapers, um, the, power, the image on the, um, uh, on the cover of Time magazine of the little girl in the pink shirt looking up at Donald Trump looming over her. Um, so the figure of the child is mobilized time and again um, uh, by uh, the opponents of this administration to challenge their, migration, their uh, migrant um, policies. Um, so children have a, a symbolic power that I think presents a potent constraint on the lawlessness of this administration and on the cruelty of this administration. And conversely, immigrant rights activists and advocates have likewise successfully mobilized these images and this rhetoric of childhood and ideas about children's rights and the well-being of children and what ch and children have a right to their families. And we saw some of those, I think, that some of that rhetoric in the, in the video that we saw earlier. Um, so we have... A, 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 it, rights activists have powerfully mobilized these ideas of the best interests of the child, of childhood innocence and vulnerability. Um, the idea of baby jail itself, that very word captures, right, the mobilization of ideas about childhood and how babies shouldn't, aren't supposed to be in jail, right? Um, at the same time, the administration has also 
played this discursive game and has also tried to mobilize ideas of um, childhood innocence and vulnerability. So how do you square a policy that criminalizes migrants with the fact that so many migrants are in diapers? Well, one way that you can do so is by painting migrant children not as criminals, but as victims of criminals. And here's where we get the child trafficking framing of migration. According to immigration officials, when parents hire smugglers or others to help spirit their children um, out of their homes and across the border, they become complicit in human trafficking. Um, according to one ICE statement, the risks associated with smuggling children into the US present a constant humanitarian threat. The sponsors who have placed children uh, directly into harm's way will be held accountable for their role in these conspiracies. Of course, the adults who are, um, should be held accountable for their role in these conspiracies are parents and family members who are looking out for the best, presumably the best interests of these children. So migration involving children in this discourse is framed as something other than migration. It's framed as a criminal act, as human trafficking, right? And once again, the symbolic politics of childhood help us to understand where we, where we get that rhetoric. Um, so ultimately, I think thinking about, and here I wanna wrap up, um, thinking about this migratory episode, event, crisis, whatever you wanna call it, as an episode of child migration helps us to, helps to illuminate certain dynamics um, child migration, again, has produced certain institutions and policies and ideas. Um, those responses reveal the unbounded cruelty, I think, of this administration, but they also reveal the limitations of its power. Um, many of the major efforts of anti-immigrant policy in the past two years, from family separation to attempts to abolish the Flores settlement, reflect attempts specifically to chip away at the legal and political constraints imposed by child migration. So far, those uh, attempts have by and large failed. However, I don't want to end on an up note. Unlike Jose, I want to end on a down note <laughs> because I think we've been through enough in the past few years uh, to know that we should always keep our guard up. Um, when we were at Dili in the last uh, 10 days, uh, there was discussion of, again, an unprecedented surge in migration of, of families at the border, new talk of a, of a crisis, a kind of quickening drumbeat of, um, of uh, worry and alarm. Um, and so I think it remains to be seen where we're going. Um, I'm frankly worried that this quickening drumbeat is going to be used as a pretext for the next god-awful policy of this administration. So I wanna end on that down note. Thank you.